This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Christine Blashford, www.wokeupthismorning.co.uk. The Price of Love by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 4 In the Night. Part 1 Louis stood hesitant and slightly impatient in the parlour alone. A dark blue cloth now covered the table, and in the centre of it was a large copper jar containing an evergreen plant. Of the feast no material trace remained except a few crumbs on the floor, but the room was still pervaded by the emotional effluence of the perturbed souls who had just gone, and Louis felt it, though without understanding. Throughout the evening he had, of course, been preoccupied by the consciousness of having in his pocket banknotes to a value unknown. Several times he had sought for a suitable opportunity to disclose his exciting secret, but he had found none. In practice he could not say to his aunt, before Julian and Rachel, "'Auntie, I picked up a lot of banknotes on the landing. You really ought to be more careful.' He could not even in any way refer to them. The dignity of Mrs. Maldon had intimidated him. He had decided, after Julian's announcement of departure, that he would hand them over to her, simply and undramatically, and with no triumphant air, as soon as he and she should for a moment be alone together. Then Mrs. Maldon vanished upstairs, and she had not returned. Rachel also had vanished, and he was waiting. He desired to examine the notes, to let his eyes luxuriously rest upon them, but he dared not take them from his pocket, lest one or other of the silent-footed women might surprise him by a sudden entrance. He fingered them as they lay in their covert, and the mere feel of them raised exquisite images in his mind, and at the same time the whole room and every object in the room was transformed into a secret witness which spied upon him, disquieted him, and warned him. But the fact that the notes were intact, that nothing irremediable had occurred, reassured him and gave him strength, so that he could defy the suspicions of those senseless surrounding objects. Within the room there was no sound but the faint regular hiss of the gas and an occasional falling together of coal in the weakening fire. Overhead, from his aunt's bedroom, vague movements were perceptible. Then these ceased, absolutely. The tension, increasing, grew too much for him, and with a curt gesture and a self-conscious expression between a smile and a frown, he left the parlour and stood to listen in the lobby. Not for several seconds did he notice the heavy ticking of the clock close to his ear, nor the chill draught that came under the front door. He gazed up into the obscurity at the top of the stairs. The red glow of the kitchen fire in the distance to the right of the stairs caught his attention at intervals. He was obsessed, almost overpowered, by the mysteriousness of the first floor. What had happened? What was happening? And suddenly an explanation swept into his brain, the obvious explanation. His aunt had missed the banknotes, and was probably at that very instant working herself into an anguish. What ought he to do? Should he run up and knock at her door? He was spared a decision by the semi-miraculous appearance of Rachel at the top of the stairs. She started. "'Oh, how you frightened me!' she exclaimed in a low voice. He answered weakly, charmingly, "'Did I?' "'Will you please come and speak to Mrs. Maldon? She wants you.' "'In her room?' Rachel nodded and disappeared before he could ask another question. With heart beating he ascended the stairs by twos. Through the half-open door of the faintly lit room which he himself would occupy he could hear Rachel active, and then he was at the closed door of his aunt's room. "'I must be jolly careful how I do it,' he thought, as he knocked. Part two. He was surprised and impressed to see Mrs. Maldon in bed. She lay on her back with her striking head raised high on several pillows. Nothing else of her was visible. The purple eiderdown covered the whole bed without a crease. "'Hello, Auntie,' he greeted her, instinctively modifying his voice to the soft gentleness proper to the ordered and solemn chamber. Mrs. Maldon, moving her head, looked at him in silence. He tiptoed to the foot of the bed and leaned on it gracefully and as in the parlour his shadow had fallen on the table, so now, with the gas just behind him, it fell on the bed. The room was chilly, and had a slight pharmaceutical odour. Mrs. Maldon said, with a weak effort, "'I was feeling faint, and Rachel thought I'd better get straight to bed. I'm an old woman, Louis.' "'She hasn't missed them,' he thought in a flash, and said aloud, "'Nothing of the sort, Auntie." He was aware of the dim reflection of himself in the mirror of the immense Victorian mahogany wardrobe to his left. Mrs. Maldon again hesitated before speaking. "'You aren't ill, are you, Auntie?' he said, in a cheerful, friendly whisper. He was touched by the poignant pathos of her great age and her debility. It rent his heart to think that she had no prospect but the grave. She murmured, ignoring his question. "'I just wanted to tell you that you needn't go down home for your night things, unless you specially want to, that is. I have all that's necessary here, and I've given orders to Rachel.' "'Certainly, Auntie. I won't leave the house. That's all right.' No, she assuredly had not missed the notes. He was strangely uplifted. He felt almost joyous in his relief. 
Could he tell her now as she lay in her bed? Impossible. He would tell her in the morning. It would be cruel to disturb her now with such a revelation of her own negligence. He vibrated with sympathy for her, and he was proud to think that she appreciated the affectionate, comprehending, subdued intimacy of his attitude towards her as he leaned gracefully on the foot of the bed, and that she admired him. He did not know, or rather he absolutely did not realise, that she was acquainted with Alt against his good fame. He forgot his sins with the insouciance of an animal. "'Don't stay up too late,' said Mrs. Maldon, as it were dismissing him. "'A long night will do you no harm for once in a way,' she smiled. "'I know you'll see that everything's locked up.' He nodded soothingly, and stood upright. "'You might turn the gas down, rather low.' He tripped to the gas-bracket, and put the room in obscurity. The light of the street-lamp irradiated the pale green blinds of the two windows. "'That do?' "'Nicely, thank you. Good night, my dear. No, I'm not ill, but you know I have these little attacks, and then the bed's the best place for me.' Her voice seemed to expire. He crept across the wide carpet, and departed with the skill of a trained nurse, and inaudibly closed the door. From the landing the whole of the rest of the house seemed to offer itself to him in the night as an enigmatic and alluring field of adventure. Should he drop the notes under the chair on the landing where he had found them? He could not, he could not. He moved to the head of the stairs, past the open door of the spare bedroom, which was now dark. He stopped at the head of the stairs, and then descended. The kitchen was lighted. "'Are you there?' he asked. "'Yes,' replied Rachel. "'May I come?' "'Why, of course,' her voice trembled. He went towards the other young creature in the house. The old one lay above, in a different world, remote and foreign. He and Rachel had the ground floor and all its nocturnal enchantment to themselves. Part 3 Mechanically, as he went into the kitchen, he drew his cigarette-case from his pocket. It was the proper gesture of a man in any minor crisis. He was not a frequenter of kitchens, and this visit, even more than the brief first one, seemed to him to be adventurous. Mrs. Maldon's kitchen, or rather Rachel's, was small, warm, though the fire was nearly out, and agreeable to the eye. On the left wall was a deal-dresser, full of crockery, and on the right, under the low window, a narrow deal-table. In front, opposite the door, gleamed the range, and on either side of the range were cupboards with oak-grained doors. There was a bright steel fender before the range, and then a hearth-rug on which stood an oak rocking-chair. The floor was a friendly checker of red and black tiles. On the high mantelpiece were canisters and an alarm-clock, and utensils. Sundry other utensils hung on the walls, among the coloured images of sweet girls and Norse-like men offered by grocers and butchers under the guise of almanacs and cupboard doors ajar dimly disclosed other utensils still, so that the kitchen had the effect of a novel, comfortable kind of workshop, which effect was helped by the clothes-dryer that hung on pulley-ropes from the ceiling next to the gas-pendant and to a stalactite of onions. The uncurtained window, instead of showing black, gave on another interior, whitewashed and well illuminated by the kitchen gas. This other interior had, under a previous tenant of the property, been a lean-to greenhouse, but Mrs. Maldon esteeming a scullery before a greenhouse, it had been modified into a scullery. There it was that Julian Maldon had preferred to make his toilet. One had to pass through the scullery in order to get from the kitchen into the yard, and the light of day had to pass through the imperfectly transparent glass roof of the scullery in order to reach the window of the unused room behind the parlour, and herein lay the reason why that room was unused, it being seldom much brighter than a crypt. At the table stood Rachel, in her immense pinafore apron, busy with knives and forks and spoons, and an enamel basin from which steam rose gently. Louis looked upon Rachel, and for the first time in his life liked an apron. It struck him as an exceedingly piquant addition to the young woman's garments. It suited her, it set off the tints of her notable hair, and it suited the kitchen. Without delaying her work, Rachel made the protector of the house very welcome. Obviously she was in a high state of agitation. For an instant Louis feared that the agitation was due to anxiety on account of Mrs. Maldon. "'Nothing serious up with the old lady, is there?' he asked, pinching the cigarette to regularise the tobacco in it. "'Oh, no!' The exclamation, in its absolute sincerity, dissipated every trace of his apprehension. He felt gay, calmly happy, and yet excited, too. He was sure, then, that Rachel's agitation was a pleasurable agitation. It was caused solely by his entrance into the kitchen, by the compliment he was paying to her kitchen. Her eyes glittered, her face shone, her little movements were electric. She was intensely conscious of herself, all because he had come into her kitchen. She could not conceal, perhaps she did not wish to conceal, the joy that his near presence inspired. Louis had had few adventures, very few, and this experience was exquisite and wondrous to him. It roused not the fatuous coxcomb, nor the Lothario, but that in him which was honest and high-spirited. A touch of the male's vanity, not surprising, was to be excused. "'Mrs. Maldon,' said Rachel, "'had an idea that it was me who suggested your staying all night instead of your cousin.' She raised her chin and peered at nothing through the window as she rubbed away at a spoon. 
"'But when?' Louis demanded, moving towards the fire. It appeared to him that the conversation had taken a most interesting turn. "'When? When you brought the train here for me, I suppose. And I suppose you explained to her that I had the idea all out of my own little head. I told her that I should never have dreamed of asking such a thing.' The susceptible and proud young creature indicated that the suggestion was one of Mrs. Maldon's rare social errors, and that Mrs. Maldon had had a narrow escape of being snubbed for it by the woman of the world now washing silver. "'I'm no more afraid of burglars than you are,' Rachel added. "'I should just like to catch a burglar here, that I should.' Louis indulgently doubted the reality of this courage. He had been too hastily concluding that what Rachel resented was an insinuation of undue interest in himself, whereas she now made it seem that she was objecting merely to any reflection upon her valour, which was much less exciting to him. Still, he thought that both causes might have contributed to her delightful indignation. "'Why was she so keen about having one of us to sleep here to-night?' Louis inquired. "'Well, I don't know that she was,' answered Rachel. "'If you hadn't said anything—' "'Oh, but do you know what she said to me upstairs?' No. She didn't want me even to go back to my digs for my things. Evidently she doesn't care for the house to be left even for half an hour. Well, of course, old people are apt to get nervous, you know, especially when they're not well. Funny, isn't it? There was perfect unanimity between them as to the irrational singularity and sad weakness of aged persons. Louis remarked, She said you would make everything right for me upstairs. I have done, I hope, said Rachel. Thanks awfully. One part of the table was covered with newspaper. Suddenly Rachel tore a strip off the newspaper, folded the strip into a spill, and, lighting it at the gas, tendered it to Louis's unlit cigarette. The climax of the movement was so quick and unexpected as almost to astound Louis, for he had been standing behind her, and she had not turned her head before making the spill. Perhaps there was a faint reflection of himself in the window, or perhaps she had eyes in her hair. Beyond doubt she was a strange, rare, angelic girl." The gesture with which she modestly offered the spill was angelic, it was divine, it was one of those phenomena which persist in a man's memory for decades. At the very instant of its happening he knew that he should never forget it. The man of fashion blushed as he inhaled the first smoke created by her fire. Rachel dropped the heavenly emblem all burning into the ash-bin of the range and resumed her work. Louis coughed. "'Any law against sitting down?' he asked. "'You're very welcome,' she replied primly. "'I didn't know I might smoke,' he said. She made no answer at first, but just as Louis had ceased to expect an answer, she said, "'I should think if you can smoke in the sitting-room you can smoke in the kitchen, shouldn't you?' "'I should,' said he. There was silence, but silence not disagreeable. Louis, lolling in the chair and slightly rocking it, watched Rachel at her task. She completely immersed spoons and forks in the warm water, and then rubbed them with a brush like a large nail-brush, giving particular attention to the inside edges of the prongs of the forks, and then she laid them all wet on a thick cloth to the right of the basin. But of the knives she immersed only the blades, and took the most meticulous care that no drop of water should reach the handles. "'I never knew knives and forks and things were washed like that,' observed Louis. "'They generally aren't,' said Rachel. "'But they ought to be. I leave all the other washing up for the charwoman in the morning, but I wouldn't trust these to her.' The charwoman had been washing up cutlery since before Rachel was born. "'They're all alike,' said Rachel. Louis acquiesced sagely in this broad generalization as to charwomen. "'Why don't you wash the handles of the knives?' he queried. "'It makes them come loose.' "'Really?' "'Do you mean to say you didn't know that water, especially warm water with soda in it, loosens the handles?' She showed astonishment, but her gaze never left the table in front of her. "'Not me.' "'Well, I should have thought that everybody knew that.' Some people use a jug and fill it up with water just high enough to cover the blades and stick the knives in to soak, but I don't hold with that because of the steam, you see. Steam's nearly as bad as water for the handles. And then some people drop the knives wholesale into a basin just for a second to wash the handles, but I don't hold with that either. What I say is that you can get the handles clean with the cloth you wipe them dry with, that's what I say. And so there's soda in the water. A little. Well, I never knew that either. It's quite a business, it seems to me. Without doubt, Louis's notions upon domestic work were being modified with extreme rapidity. In the suburb from which he sprang, domestic work, and in particular washing up, had been regarded as base, foul, humiliating, unmentionable, a toil that any slut might perform anyhow. It would have been inconceivable to him that he should admire a girl in the very act of washing up. Young ladies, even in exclusive suburban families, were sometimes forced by circumstances to wash up. Of that he was aware but they washed up in secret and in shame, and it was proper for all parties to pretend that they never had washed up, and here was Rachel converting the horrid process into a dignified and impressive ritual. She made it as fine as fine needlework, so exact, so dainty, so proud were the motions of her fingers and her forearms. Obviously washing up was an art, and the delicate operation could not be scamped nor hurried. 
The triple pile of articles on the cloth grew slowly, but it grew, and then Rachel, having taken a fresh white cloth from a hook, began to wipe, and her wiping was an art. She seemed to recognise each fork as a separate individuality, and to attend to it as to a little animal. Whatever her view of charwomen, never would she have said of forks that they were all alike. Louis felt in his hip pocket for his reserve cigarette case, and Rachel immediately said with her back to him, "'Have you really got a revolver, or were you teasing, just now, in the parlour? It was then that he perceived a small unframed mirror hung at the height of her face on the broad central perpendicular bar of the old-fashioned window-frame. Through this mirror the chit, so he named her in his mind at the instant, had been surveying him. "'Yes,' he said, producing the second cigarette-case. "'I was only teasing.' He lit a fresh cigarette from the end of the previous one. "'Well,' she said, "'you did frighten Mrs. Maldon. I was so sorry for her. "'And what about you? Weren't you frightened?' "'Oh, no, I wasn't frightened. I guessed, somehow, you were only teasing.' "'Well, I just wasn't teasing, then,' said Louis triumphantly, yet with benevolence. And he drew a revolver from his pocket. She turned her head now, and glanced neutrally at the incontestable revolver for a second. But she made no remark whatever, unless the pouting of her tightly shut lips and a mysterious smile amounted to a remark. Louis adopted an indifferent tone. "'Strange that the old lady should be so nervous just to-night, isn't it, seeing these burglars have been knocking about for over a fortnight? Is this the first time she's got excited about it?' "'Yes, I think it is,' said Rachel faintly, as it were submissively, with no sign of irritation against him. With their air of worldliness and mature wisdom they twittered on like a couple of sparrows, inconsequently, capriciously, and nothing that they said had the slightest originality, weight, or importance, but they both thought that their conversation was full of significance, which it was, though they could not explain it to themselves. What they happened to say did not matter in the least. If they had recited the Koran to each other, the inexplicable significance of their words would have been the same. Rachel faced him again, leaning her hands behind her on the table, and said with the most enchanting persuasive friendliness, "'I wasn't frightened, truly. I don't know why I looked as though I was.' "'You mean about the revolver in the sitting-room?' He jumped nimbly back after her to the revolver question. "'Yes, because I'm quite used to revolvers, you know. My brother had one. Only his was a colt. One of those long things. Your brother, eh?' "'Yes. Did you know him?' "'I can't say I did,' Louis replied with some constraint. Rachel said with generous enthusiasm, "'He's a wonderful shot, my brother is.' Louis was curiously touched by the warmth of her reference to her brother. In the daily long monotonous column of advertisements, headed succinctly Money, in the Staffordshire Signal, there once used to appear the following invitation. We never refuse a loan to a responsible applicant. No fussy inquiries, distance no objection, reasonable terms, strictest privacy, three pounds to ten thousand pounds, apply personally or by letter. Lovelace Curzon, 7 Colclough Street, Knipe. Upon a day Louis had chosen that advertisement from among its rivals, and had written to Lovelace Curzon. But on the very next day he had come into his thousand pounds, and so had lost the advantage of business relations with Lovelace Curzon. Lovelace Curzon, as he had learnt later, was Reuben Fleckering, Rachel's father. Or more accurately, Lovelace Curzon was Reuben Fleckering, Jr., Rachel's brother, a young man in a million. Reuben Sr. had been for many years an entirely mediocre and ambitionless clerk in the large works where Julian Maldon had learnt potting, when Reuben Jr., whom he blindly adored, had dragged him out of clerkship, and set him up as the nominal registered head of a money-lending firm. An amazing occurrence! At that time Reuben Jr. was a minor, scarcely eighteen, yet his turn for finance had been such that he had already amassed reserves, and, without a drop of Jewish blood in his veins, possessed confidence enough to compete in their own field with the acutest Hebrews of the district. Reuben Sr. was the youth's tool. In a few years Lovelace Curzon had made a mighty and terrible reputation in a world where expenditures exceed incomes, and then the subterranean news of the day, not reported in the signal, was that something serious had happened to Lovelace Curzon, and the two Fleckerings went to America, the father as usual hypnotised by the son, and they left no rack behind save Rachel. It was at this period, only a few months previous to the opening of the present narrative, that the district had first heard aught of the womenfolk of the Fleckerings. An aunt, Reuben Senior's sister, it appeared, had died several years earlier, since when Rachel had alone kept house for her brother and her father. According to rumour, the three had lived in the simplicity of relative poverty, utterly unvisited except by clients. No good smell of money had ever escaped from the small front room which was employed as an office into the domestic portion of the house. It was alleged that Rachel had existed in perfect ignorance of all details of the business. It was also alleged that when the sudden crisis arrived, her brother had told her that she would not be taken to America, and that, briefly, she must shift for herself in the world. It was alleged further that he had given her forty-five pounds. Why forty-five pounds and not fifty, no one knew. The whole affair had begun and finished, and the house was sold up in four days.' 
Public opinion in the street and in Knipe blew violently against the two Rubens, but as they were on the Atlantic it did not affect them. Rachel, with scarcely an acquaintance in the world in which she was to shift for herself, found that she had a street full of friends. It transpired that everybody had always divined that she was a girl of admirable, efficient qualities. She behaved as though her brother and father had behaved in quite a usual and proper manner. Assistance in the enterprise of shifting for herself she welcomed, but not sympathy. The devotion of the Fleckring women began to form a legend. People said that Rachel's aunt had been another such creature as Rachel. Hence the effect on Louis, who, through his aunt and his cousin, was acquainted with the main facts and surmises of Rachel's glowing reference to the vanished Reuben. "'Where did your brother practice?' he asked. "'In the cellar.' "'Of course, it's easier with a long barrel.' "'Is it?' she said incredulously. "'You should see my brother's scorecard the first time he shot at that new miniature rifle range in Hanbridge. "'Why, is it anything special?' "'Well, you should see it. Five bulls, all cutting into each other.' "'I should have liked to see that.' "'I've got it upstairs in my trunks,' said she proudly. "'I dare say I'll show you it some time.' "'I wish you would,' he urged. Such loyalty moved him deeply. Louis had had no sisters, and his youthful suburban experience of other people's sisters had not fostered any belief that loyalty was an outstanding quality of sisters. Like very numerous young men of the day, he had passed an unfavourable judgment upon young women. He had found them greedy for diversion, amazingly ruthless in their determination to exact the utmost possible expensiveness of pleasure in return for their casual society, hard, cruelly clever in conversation, efficient in certain directions, but hating any sustained effort, and either socially or artistically or politically snobbish. Snobs all! Money-worshippers all! Well, nearly all! It mattered not whether you were one of the dandies or one of the hatless or Fletcherite corpse that lolled on foot or on bicycles, or shot on motorcycles through the prim streets of the suburb, the young women would not remain in dalliance with you for the mere sake of your beautiful eyes. Because they were girls, they would take all that you had and more, and give you nothing but insolence or condescension in exchange. Such was Louis's judgment, and scores of times he had confirmed it in private saloon-lounge talk with his compeers. It had not, however, rendered the society of these unconscionable and cold female creatures distasteful to him, not a bit. He had even sought it and been ready to pay for that society in the correct manner, even to imperturbably beggaring himself of his final sixpence in order to do the honours of the latest cinema. Only he had a sense of human superiority. It certainly did not occur to him that in the victimised young men there might exist faults which complemented those of the parasitic young women. And now he contrasted these young women with Rachel, and he fell into a dreamy mood of delight in her, her gesture in lighting his cigarette, marvellous, tear-compelling. Flippancy dropped away from him. She liked him. With the most alluring innocence she did not conceal that she liked him. He remembered that the last time he called at his aunt's he had remarked something strange, something disturbing, in Rachel's candid demeanour towards himself. He had made an impression on her. He had given her the lightning-stroke. No shadow of a doubt as to his own worthiness crossed his mind. What did cross his mind was that she was not quite of his own class. In the suburb, where sets are divided one from another by unscalable barriers, she could not have aspired to him. But in the kitchen, now become the most beautiful and agreeable and romantic interior that he had ever seen, in the kitchen he could somehow perceive with absolute clearness that the snobbery of caste was silly, negligible, laughable, contemptible. Yes, he could perceive all that. Life in the kitchen seemed ideal, life with that loyalty and that candour and that charm and that lovely seriousness. Moreover, he could teach her. She had already blossomed in a fortnight. She was blossoming. She would blossom further. Odd that, when he had threatened to pull out a revolver, she, so accustomed to revolvers, should have taken a girlish alarm. That queer detail of her behaviour was extraordinarily seductive. But far beyond everything else it was the grand loyalty of her nature that drew him. He wanted to sink into it as into a bed of down. He really needed it. Enveloped in that loving loyalty of a creature who gave all and demanded nothing, he felt that he could truly be his best self, that he could work marvels. His eyes were moist with righteous ardour. The cutlery reposed in a green-lined basket. She had doffed the apron and hung it behind the scullery door. With all the delicious curves of her figure newly revealed, she was reaching the alarm clock down from the mantelpiece, and then she was winding it up. The ratchet of the wheel clacked, and the hurried ticking was loud. In the grate of the range burned one spot of gloomy red— "'Your bedtime, I suppose,' he murmured, rising elegantly. She smiled. She said, "'Shall you look up, or shall I?' "'Oh, I think I know all the tricks,' he replied, and thought, "'She's a pretty direct sort of girl, anyway.'" Part 4 About an hour later he went up to his room. It was a fact that everything had been made right for him. The gas burned low. 
He raised it, and it shone directly upon the washstand, which glittered with the ivory glaze of large earthenware, and the whiteness of towels that displayed all the creases of their folding. There was a new cake of soap in the ample soap-dish, and a new toothbrush in a sheath of transparent paper lay on the marble. Rather complete this, he reflected. The nail-brush, an article in which he specialised, was worn, but it was worn evenly, and had cost good money. The water-bottle dazzled him, its polished clarity was truly crystalline. He could not remember ever having seen a toilet array so shining with strict cleanness. Indeed, it was probable that he had never set eyes on an absolutely clean water-bottle before. The qualities associated with water-bottles in his memory were semi-opacity and spottiness. The dressing-table matched the watchstand. A carriage clock in leather had been placed on the mantelpiece. In front of the mantelpiece was an old embroidered fire-screen. Peeping between the screen and the grate, he saw that a fire had been scientifically laid, ready for lighting, but some bits of paper and oddments on the top of the coal showed that it was not freshly laid. The grate had a hob at one side, and on this was a small bright tin kettle. The bed was clearly a good bed, resilient, softly garnished. On it was stretched a long striped garment of flannel with old-fashioned pearl buttons at neck and sleeves, an honest garment quite surely unshrinkable. No doubt in the sixties, long before the mind of man had leapt to the fine perverse conception of the decorated pyjama, this garment had enjoyed the fullest correctness. Now, after perhaps forty years in the cupboards of Mrs. Molden, it seemed to recall the more excellent attributes of an already forgotten past, and to rebuke what was degenerate in the present. Louis, ranging over his experiences in the disorderly and mean pretentiousness of the suburban home, and in the discomfort of various lodgings, appreciated the grave, comfortable benignity of that bedroom. Its appeal to his senses was so strong that it became for him almost luxurious. The bedroom at his latest lodgings was full of boot-trees and trouser-stretchers and coat-holders, but it was a paltry thing and a grimy. He saw the daily and hourly advantages of marriage with a loving, simple woman whose house was her pride. He had a longing for solidities, certitude, and righteousness. Musing delectably, he drew aside the crimson curtain from the window, and beheld the same prospect that Rachel had beheld on her walk towards Friendly Street, the obscurity of the park, the chain of lamps down the slope of Moorthorne Road, and the distant fires of industry still further beyond, towards Toft End. He had hated the foul, sordid, ragged prospects and vistas of the five towns when he came new to them from London, and he had continued to hate them. They desolated him. But to-night he thought of them sympathetically. It was as if he was divining in them, for the first time, a recondite charm. He remembered what an old citizen named Dane had said one evening at the Conservative Club. "'People may say what they choose about Bursley. I've just returned from London, and I tell thee I was glad to get back. I like Bursley.' A grotesque saying he had thought then, yet now he positively felt himself capable of sharing the sentiment. Rachel in the kitchen, and the kitchen in town, and the town amid those scarred and smoking hillocks, invisible phenomena, mysterious harmonies, the influence of the night solaced and uplifted him and bestowed on him new faculties of perception. At length, deciding, after characteristic procrastination, that he must really go to bed, he wound up his watch and put it on the dressing-table. His pockets had to be emptied, and his clothes hung or folded. His fingers touched the notes in the left-hand outside pocket of his coat. Not for one instant had the problem of the banknotes been absent from his mind. Throughout the conversation with Rachel, throughout the interval between her retirement and his own, throughout his meditations in the bedroom, he had not once escaped from the obsession of the banknotes and their problem. He knew now how the problem must be solved. There was, after all, only one solution, and it was extremely simple. He must put the notes back where he had found them, underneath the chair on the landing. If advisable, he might rediscover them in the morning and surrender them immediately, but they must not remain in his room during the night, he must not examine them, he must not look at them. He approached the door quickly, lest he might never reach the door, but he was somehow forced to halt at the wardrobe, to see if it had coat-holders. It had one coat-holder. His hand was on the doorknob. He turned it with every species of precaution, and it complained loudly in the still night. The door opened with a terrible explosive noise of protest. He gazed into the darkness of the landing, and presently, by the light from the bedroom, could distinguish the vague boundaries of it. The chair, invisible, was on the left. He opened the door wider to the nocturnal riddle of the house. His hand clasped the notes in his pocket. No sound. He listened for the ticking of the lobby clock, and could not catch it. He listened more intently. It was impossible that he should not hear the ticking of the lobby clock. Was he dreaming? Was he under some delusion? Then it occurred to him that the lobby clock must have run down, or otherwise stopped. Clocks did stop. And then his heart bounded, and his flesh crept. He had heard footsteps somewhere below, or were the footsteps merely in his imagination?' 
Alone in the parlour, after Rachel had gone to bed, he had spent some time gazing at the signal, for there had been absolutely nothing else to do, and he could not have thought of sleep at such an early hour. It is true that, with his intense preoccupations, he had for the most part gazed uncomprehendingly at the signal. The tale of the latest burglaries, however, had, by virtue of its intrinsic interest, reached his brain through his eyes, and had impressed him, despite preoccupations. And now, as he stood in the gloom at the door of his bedroom, and waited feverishly for the sound of more footsteps, it was inevitable that visions of burglars should disturb him. The probability of burglars visiting any particular house in the town was infinitely slight. His common sense told him that— but supposing, just supposing, that they actually had chosen his aunt's abode for their prey. Conceivably they had learnt that Mrs. Maldon was to have a large sum of money under her roof. Conceivably a complex plan had been carefully laid. Conceivably one of the great burglaries of criminal history might be in progress. It was not impossible. No wonder that with banknotes loose all over the place, his shockingly negligent auntie should have special qualms concerning burglars on that night of all nights fortunate indeed that he carried a revolver, that the revolver was loaded, and that he had some skill to use it. A dramatic surprise, his gun and the man behind it, for burglars, who had no doubt counted on having to deal with a mere couple of women. He had but to remove his shoes and creep down the stairs. He felt at the revolver in his pocket. Often had he pictured himself in the act of calmly triumphing over burglars or other villains. Then, with no further hesitation, he silently closed the door, on the inside— how could there be burglars in the house? The suspicion was folly. What he had heard could be naught but the nocturnal cracking and yielding of an old building at night. Was it not notorious that the night was full of noises? And even if burglars had entered, better safe to ignore them. They could not make off with a great deal, for the main item of prey happened to be in his own pocket. Let them search for the treasure. If they had the effrontery to come searching in his bedroom, he would give them a reception. Let them try. He looked at the revolver, holding it beneath the gas. Could he aim it at a human being? or another explanation possibly rachel having forgotten something or having need of something had gone downstairs for it he had not thought of that but what more natural sudden toothache a desire for laudanum a visit to a store cupboard such was the classic order of events he listened secure within the four walls of his bedroom he smiled he could have fancied that he heard an electric bell ring ever so faintly at a distance in the next house in the next world he laughed to himself then at length he moved again towards the door and he paused in front of it there were no burglars. The notion of burglars was idiotic. He must put the notes back under the chair. His whole salvation depended upon his putting the notes back under the chair on the landing, an affair of two seconds. With due caution he opened the door, and simultaneously, at the very self-same instant, he most distinctly heard the click of the latch of his aunt's bedroom door, next to his own. Now, in a horrible quandary, trembling and perspiring, he felt completely nonplussed. He pushed his own door to, but without quite closing it, for fear of a noise, and edged away from it towards the fireplace. Had his aunt wakened up, and felt a misgiving about the notes, and found that they were not where they ought to be? No further sound came through the crack of his door. In the dwelling, absolute silence seemed to be established. He stood thus for an indefinite period in front of the fireplace, the brain's action apparently suspended, until his agitation was somewhat composed, and then, because he had no clear plan in his head, he put his hand into the pocket containing the notes and drew them out, and immediately he was aware of a pleasant feeling of relief, as one who, after battling against a delicious and shameful habit, yields and is glad. The beauty of the notes was eternal, no use could stale it. Their intoxicating effect on him was just as powerful now as before supper. And now, as then, the mere sight of them filled him with a passionate conviction that without them he would be ruined. His tricks to destroy the suspicions of Horrocleave could not possibly be successful. Within twenty-four hours he might be in prison if he could not forthwith command a certain sum of money, and even possessing the money he would still have an extremely difficult part to play. It would be necessary for him to arrive early at the works, to change notes for gold in the safe to erase many of his pencilled false additions, to devise a postponement of his crucial scene with Horrocleave, and lastly to invent a plausible explanation of the piling up of a cash reserve. If he had not been optimistic and an incurable procrastinator, and a believer in luck at the last moment, he would have seen that nothing but a miracle could save him if Horrocleave were indeed suspicious. Happily for his peace of mind, he was incapable of looking a fact in the face. Against all reason, he insisted to himself that with the notes he might reach salvation— he did not trouble even to estimate the chances of the notes being traced by their numbers. Such is the magic force of a weak character. But he powerfully desired not to steal the notes, or any of them. The image of Rachel rose between him and his temptation. Her honesty, candour, loyalty, had revealed to him the beauty of the ways of righteousness. He had been born again in her glance. He saw he would do nothing unworthy of the ideals she had unconsciously set up in him. 
He admitted that it was supremely essential for him to restore the notes to the spot where he had removed them, and yet if he did so, and was lost, what then? For one second he saw himself in the dock at the police court in the town hall. Awful hallucination! If it became reality, what use, then, his obedience to the new ideal? Better to accomplish this one act of treason to the ideal, in order to be able for ever afterwards to obey it, and to look Rachel in the eyes. Was it not so? He wanted advice, he wanted to be confirmed in his own opportunism, as a starving beggar may want food. And in the midst of all this torture of his vacillations he was staggered and overwhelmed by the sudden noise of Mrs. Molden's door brusquely opening, and of an instant loud firm knock on his own door. The silence of the night was shattered as by an earthquake. Almost mechanically he crushed the notes in his left hand, crushed them into a ball, and the knuckles of that hand turned white with the muscular tension. "'Are you up?' a voice demanded. It was Rachel's voice." "'Yes,' he answered, and held his left hand over the screen in front of the fireplace. "'May I come in?' And with the word she came in. She was summarily dressed, and very pale, and her hair more notable than ever was down. As she entered, he opened his hand and let the ball of notes drop into the littered grate. Part five. "'Anything the matter?' he asked, moving away from the region of the hearthrug. She glanced at him with a kind of mild indulgence, as if to say, "'Surely you don't suppose I should be wandering about in the night like this if nothing was the matter?' She replied, speaking quickly and eagerly, "'I'm so glad you aren't in bed. I want you to go and fetch the doctor at once. Aren't he ill?' She gave him another glance, like the first, as if to say, "'I'm not ill, and you aren't, and Mrs. Molden is the only other person in the house.' "'I'll go instantly,' he added in haste. "'Which doctor?' "'Yardley, in Park Road. It's near the corner of Ax Street. You'll know it by the yellow gate, even if his lamp isn't lighted.' "'I thought old Hawley up at Hillport was Auntie's doctor.' "'I believe he is, but you couldn't get up to Hillport in less than half an hour, could you?' "'Not so serious as all that, is it?' "'Well, you never know. Best to be on the safe side. It's not quite like one of her usual attacks. She's been upset. She actually went downstairs.' "'I thought I heard somebody. Did you hear her, then?' "'No, she rang for me afterwards. There's a little electric bell over my bed from her room.' "'And I heard that, too,' said Louis. "'Will you ask Dr. Yardley to come at once?' "'I'm off,' said he. "'What a good thing I wasn't in bed.' "'What a good thing you're here at all,' Rachel murmured, suddenly smiling. He was waiting anxiously for her to leave the room again, but instead of leaving it she came to the fireplace and looked behind the screen. He trembled. "'Oh, that kettle is there! I thought it must be!' and picked it up. Then, with the kettle in one hand, she went to a large cupboard let into the wall opposite the door and opened it. "'You know Park Road, I suppose?' she turned to him. "'Yes, yes, I'm off.' He was obliged to go, surrendering the room to her. As he descended the stairs he heard her come out of the room. She was following him downstairs. "'Don't bang the door,' she whispered. "'I'll come and shut it after you.' The next moment he had undone the door, and was down the front steps and in the solitude of Biker's Lane. He ran up the street, full of the one desire to accomplish his errand and be back again in the spare bedroom alone. The notes were utterly safe where they lay, and yet astounding events might happen. Was it not a unique coincidence that on this very night, and no other, his aunt should fall ill, and that as a result Rachel should take him unawares at the worst moment of his dilemma? And further, could it be the actual fact, as he had been wildly guessing only a few minutes earlier, that his aunt had at last missed the notes? Could it be that it was the discovery which had upset her and brought on an attack? An attack of what? He swerved at the double into Park Road, which was a silent desert watched over by forlorn gas-lamps. He saw the yellow gate. The yellow gate clanked after him. He searched in the deep shadow of the porch for the button of the night-bell, and had to strike a match in order to find it. He rang, waited, and waited, rang again, waited, rang a third time, keeping his finger hard on the button, then arose and expired a flickering light in the hall of the house. "'That'll do, that'll do, you needn't wear the bell out!' He could hear the irritated accents through the glazed front door. A dim figure in a dressing-gown opened. "'Are you Dr. Yardley?' Louis gasped between rapid breaths. "'What is it?' the question was savage. With his extraordinary instinctive amiability, Louis smiled naturally and persuasively. "'You're wanted at Mrs. Molden's, bikers. Awfully sorry to disturb you.' "'Oh,' said the dressing-gown, in a changed, interested tone. "'Mrs. Molden's, right, I'll follow you.' "'You'll come at once,' Louis urged. "'I shall come at once.' The door was curtly closed. "'So that's how you call a doctor in the middle of the night,' thought Louis, and ran off. He had scarcely deciphered the man's face. The return, being chiefly downhill, was less exhausting. As he approached his aunt's house, he saw that there was a light on the ground floor, as well as in the front bedroom. The door opened as he swung the gate. The lobby gas had been lighted. Rachel was waiting for him. Her hair was tied up now. The girl looked wise, absurdly so. It was as though she was engaged in the act of being equal to the terrible occasion. "'He's coming,' said Louis. "'You've been frightfully quick,' said she, as if triumphantly. She appeared to glory in the crisis.' 
He passed within as she held the door. He was frantic to rush upstairs to the fireplace in his room, but he had to seem deliberate. "'And what next?' he inquired. "'Well, nothing. It'll be best for you to sit in your bedroom for a bit. That's the only place where there's a fire. And it's rather chilly at this time of night.' "'A fire?' he repeated, incredulous and yet awestruck. "'I knew you wouldn't mind,' said she. "'It just happened there wasn't two drops of methylated spirits left in the house, and as there was a fire laid in your room, I put a match to it. I must have hot water ready, you see. And Mrs. Maldon only has one of those old-fashioned gas-stoves in her bedroom.' "'I see,' he agreed. They mounted the steps together. The grate in his room was a mass of pleasant flames, in the midst of which gleamed the bright kettle. "'How is she now?' he asked in a trance, and he felt as though it was another man in his own body who was asking. "'Oh, it's not very serious, I hope,' said Rachel, kneeling to coax the fire with a short, wiry poker. "'Only you never know. I'm just going in again. She seems to lose all her vitality. That's what's apt to frighten you.' The girl looked wise, absurdly, deliciously wise. The spectacle of her engaged in the high act of being equal to the occasion was exquisite. But Louis had no eye for it. End of chapter 4This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Christine Blashford, www.wokeupthismorning.co.uk. The Price of Love by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 5 News of the Night. Part 1. The next morning, Mrs. Tarns, the charwoman whom Rachel had expressly included in the dogma that all charwomen are alike, was cleaning the entranceway to Mrs. Maldon's house. She had washed and stoned the steep, uneven flight of steps leading up to the front door, and the flat space between them and the gate, and now, before finishing the step down to the footpath, she was wiping the grimy ledges of the green iron gate itself. Mrs. Tarns was a woman of nearly sixty, stout, and, in appearance, untidy and dirty. The wet wind played with grey wisps of her hair, and with her coarse brown apron, beneath which her skirt was pinned up. Human eyes so seldom saw her without a coarse brown apron that, apronless, she would have almost seemed, like Eve, to be unattired. It and a pail were the insignia of her vocation. She was accomplished and conscientious. She could be trusted. Despite appearances, her habits were clingy. She was also a woman of immense experience. In addition to being one of the finest exponents of the art of stepstoning and general housework that the five towns could show, she had numerous other talents. She was thoroughly accustomed to the supreme spectacles of birth and death, and could assist thereat with dignity and skill. She could turn away the wrath of rent-collectors, rate-collectors, school inspectors, and magistrates. She was an adept in enticing an inebriated husband to leave a public house. She could feed four children for a day on sevenpence, and rise calmly to her feet after having been knocked down by one stroke of a fist. She could go without food, sleep, and love, and yet thrive. She could give when she had nothing, and keep her heart sweet and every contagion. Lastly, she could coax extra sixpences out of a pawnbroker. She had never had a holiday, and almost never failed in her duty. Her one social fault was a tendency to talk at great length about babies, corpses, and the qualities of rival soaps. All her children were married— her husband had gone in a box to a justice whose anger Mrs. Tarn's simple tongue might not soothe. She lived alone. Six half-days a week she worked about the house of Mrs. Maldon from eight to one o'clock, for a shilling per half-day and her breakfast. But if she chose to stay for it she could have dinner, and a good one, on condition that she washed up afterwards. She often stayed. After over forty years of incessant and manifold expert labour she was happy and content in this rich reward. A long automobile came slipping with noiseless stealth down the hill, and halted opposite the gate, in silence, for the engine had been stopped higher up. Mrs. Tarns, intimidated by the August phenomenon, ceased to rub, and in alarm watched the great Thomas Batchgrew struggle unsuccessfully with the handle of the door that imprisoned him. Mrs. Tarns was a born serf, and her nature was such that she wanted to apologise to Thomas Batchgrew for the naughtiness of the door. For her there was something monstrous in a personage like Thomas Batchgrew being balked in a desire, even for a moment, by a perverse door-catch. Not that she really respected Thomas Batchgrew, she did not, but he was a member of the sacred governing class. The chauffeur, not John's Ernest, but a professional, flashed round the front of the car and opened the door with obsequious haste. For Thomas Batchgrew had to be appeased. Already a delay of twenty minutes due to a defective tyre and to the inexcusable absence of the spanner with which the spare wheel was manipulated had aroused his just anger. 
Mrs. Tarns pulled the gate towards herself, and, crushed behind it, curtsy to Thomas Batchgrew, this curtsy, the most servile of all Western salutations, and now nearly unknown in five towns, consisted in a momentary shortening of the stature by six inches, and in nothing else. Mrs. Tarns had acquired it in her native village of Snade, where an earl held fast to that which was good, and she had never been able to quite lose it. It did far more than the celerity of the chauffeur to appease Thomas Batchgrew. Snorting and self-conscious, and with his white whiskers flying behind him, he stepped in his two overcoats across the narrow, muddy pavement, and on to Mrs. Tarn's virgin stonework, and with two haughty black footmarks he instantly ruined it. The tragedy produced no effect on Mrs. Tarn's, and indeed nobody in the five towns would have been moved by it, for the social convention as to porticoes enjoined not that they should remain clean, but simply that they should show evidence of having been clean at some moment early in each day. It mattered not how dirty they were in general, provided that the religious and futile rite of stoning had been demonstrably performed during the morning. Mrs. Tarns adroitly moved her bucket aside, though there was plenty of room for feet even larger than those of Thomas Batchgrew, and then waited to be spoken to. She was not spoken to. Mr. Batchgrew, after hesitating and clearing his throat, proceeded up the steps, defiling them. As he did so, Mrs. Tarns screwed together all her features and clenched her hands as if in agony, and stared horribly at the open front door, which was blowing too. It seemed that she was trying to arrest the front door by sheer force of muscular contraction. She did not succeed. Gently the door closed, with a firm click of its latch, in face of Mr. Batchgrew. "'Nay, nay,' muttered Mrs. Tarns, desolated. And Mr. Batchgrew, once more justly angered, raised his hand to the heavy knocker. "'Dunna knock, Mr. Dunna knock,' Mrs. Tarns implored in a whisper. "'Missus is asleep. Miss Rachel's been up all night with her, seemingly, and now her's gone off in a doze-like, and Miss Rachel's resting too, on the squab in the parlour. Doctor was fetched.' Apparently charging Mrs. Tarns with responsibility for the illness, Mr. Batchgrew demanded severely— "'What was it?' "'One of them attacks as her as,' said Mrs. Tarns, with a meekness that admitted she could offer no defence. "'Only worse.' "'Hurry round to the back door and let me in.' "'I doubt back doors bolted on the inside,' said Mrs. Tarns, with deep humility. "'This is ridiculous,' said Mr. Batchgrew, truly. "'Am I to stand here all day?' and raised his hand to the knocker. Mrs. Tarns, with swiftness, darted up the steps and inserted a large, fat, wet hand between the raised knocker and its bed. It was the sublime gesture of a martyr, and her large brown eyes gazed submissively, yet firmly, at Mr. Batchgrew with the look of a martyr. She had nothing to gain by the defiance of a great man, but she could not permit her honoured employer to be wakened. She was accustomed to emergencies and to desperate deeds therein, and she did not fail now in promptly taking the right course, regardless of consequences. Somewhat younger than Mr. Batchgrew in years, she was older in experience and in wisdom. She could do a thousand things well, Mr. Batchgrew could do nothing well. At that very moment she conquered, and he was beaten. Yet her brown eyes, and even the sturdy uplifted arm, cringed to him, and asked in abasement to be forgiven for the impiety committed. From her other hand a cloth dripped foul water on to the topmost step. And then the door yielded. Thomas Batchgrew and Mrs. Tarns both abandoned the knocker. Rachel, pale as a lily, stern, with dilated eyes, stood before them, and Mr. Batchgrew realised, as he looked at her against the dark, hushed background of the stairs, that Mrs. Maldon was indeed ill. Mrs. Tarns respectfully retired down the steps, and mightier than she, the young, naive, ignorant girl, to whom she could have taught everything save possibly the art of washing cutlery, had relieved her of responsibility. "'You can't see her,' said Rachel, in a low tone, trembling. Thomas Batchgrew spluttered ineffectively. "'Do you know I'm her trustee, miss? Let me come in.' Rachel would not take her hand off the inner knob. There was the thin, far-off sound of an electric bell breaking the silence of the house. It was the bell in Rachel's bedroom, rung from Mrs. Maldon's bedroom, and at this mysterious signal from the invalid, this faint proof that the hidden sufferer had consciousness and volition, Rachel started, and Thomas Batchgrew started. "'Her bell!' Rachel exclaimed, and fled upstairs. In the large bedroom Mrs. Maldon lay apparently at ease. "'Did they waken you?' cried Rachel, distressed. "'Who is there, dear?' Mrs. Maldon asked, in a voice that had almost recovered from the weakness of the night. Rachel was astounded. "'Mr. Batchgrew. I must see him,' said the old lady. "'But I must see him at once,' Mrs. Maldon repeated. "'At once. Kindly bring him up,' and she added in a curiously even and resigned tone. "'I've lost all that money.' Part two. "'Nay,' said Mrs. Maldon to Thomas Batchgrew. "'I'm not going to die just yet.' Her voice was cheerful, even a little brisk, and she spoke with a benign smile in the tranquil accents of absolute conviction. But she did not move her head. She waited to look at Thomas Batchgrew until he came within her field of vision at the foot of the bed. This quiescence had a disconcerting effect, contradicting her voice. She was lying on her back, in the posture customary to her, the arms being stretched down by the sides under the bedquilt. 
Her features were drawn slightly askew, the skin was shiny, the eyes stared, as though Mrs. Maldon had been a hysterical subject. It was evident that she had passed through a tremendous physical crisis. Nevertheless, Rachel was still astounded at the change for the better in her, wrought by sleep and the force of her obstinate vitality. The contrast between the scene which Thomas Batchgrew now saw and the scene which had met Rachel in the night was so violent as to seem nearly incredible. Not a sign of the catastrophe remained, except in Mrs. Maldon's face, and in some invalid gear on the dressing-table, for Rachel had gradually got the room into order. She had even closed and locked the wardrobe. On answering Mrs. Maldon's summons in the night, Rachel had found the central door of the wardrobe swinging, and the sacred big drawer at the bottom of that division only half shut, and Mrs. Maldon in a peignoir lying near it on the floor, making queer, inhuman noises, not moans, but a kind of anxious, inarticulate entreaty, and shaking her head constantly to the left, never to the right. Mrs. Maldon had recognised Rachel, and had seemed to implore with agonised intensity her powerful assistance in some nameless and hopeless tragic dilemma. The sight, especially of the destruction of the old woman's dignity, was dreadful to such an extent that Rachel did not realise its effect on herself until several hours afterwards. At the moment she called on the immense reserves of her self-confidence to meet the situation, and she met it, assisting her pride with the curious pretence characteristic of the Five Towns race, that the emergency was insufficient to alarm in the slightest degree a person of sagacity and sang-froid. She had restored Mrs. Maldon to her bed, and to some of her dignity, but the horrid symptoms were not thereby abated. The inhuman noises and the distressing incomprehensible appeal had continued. Immediately Rachel's back was turned, Mrs. Maldon had fallen out of bed. This happened three times, so that clearly the sufferer was falling out of bed under the urgency of some half-conscious purpose. Rachel had soothed her, and once she had managed to say with some clearness the words, "'I've been downstairs.' But when Rachel went back to the room from dispatching Louis for the doctor, she was again on the floor. Louis's absence from the house had lasted an intolerable age, but the doctor had followed closely on the messenger, and already the symptoms had become a little less acute. The doctor had diagnosed with rapidity. Supervening upon her ordinary cardiac attack after supper, Mrs. Maldon had had in the night an embolus in one artery of the brain. The way in which the doctor announced the fact showed to Rachel that nothing could easily have been more serious and yet the mere naming of the affliction eased her, although she had no conception of what an embolus might be. Dr. Yardley had remained until four o'clock, when Mrs. Maldon, surprisingly convalescent, dropped off to sleep. He remarked that she might recover. At eight o'clock he had come back. Mrs. Maldon was awake, but had apparently no proper recollection of the events of the night, which even to Rachel had begun to seem unreal, like a waning hallucination. The doctor gave orders with optimism, and left sufficiently reassured to allow himself to yawn. At a quarter past eight Louis had departed to his own affairs, on Rachel's direct suggestion. And when Mrs. Tarns had been informed of the case so full of disturbing enigmas, while Rachel and she drank tea together in the kitchen, the daily domestic movement of the house was partly resumed, from vanity because Rachel could not bear to sit idle, nor to admit to herself that she had been scared to a standstill. And now Mrs. Maldon, in full possession of her faculties, faced Thomas Batchgrew for the interview which she had insisted on having, and Rachel waited with an uncanny apprehension, her ears full of the mysterious and frightful phrase, "'I've lost all that money!' Part 3 Mrs. Maldon, after a few words had passed as to her illness, used exactly the same phrase again, "'I've lost all that money!' Mr. Batchgrew snorted and glanced at Rachel for an explanation. "'Yes, it's all gone,' proceeded Mrs. Maldon, with calm resignation. "'But I'm too old to worry. Please listen to me. "'We lost my serviette and ring last evening at supper, couldn't find it anywhere, "'and in the night it suddenly occurred to me where it was. "'I've remembered everything now, almost, and I'm quite sure. "'You know you first told me to put the money in the wardrobe. "'Now before you said that I had thought of putting it on the top of the cupboard "'to the right of the fireplace in the back room downstairs. "'I thought that would be a good place for it in case burglars did come. "'No burglar would ever think of looking there.' "'God bless me,' Mr. Batchgrew muttered, scornfully protesting. "'It couldn't possibly be seen, you see. However, I thought I ought to respect your wish, and so I decided I'd put part of it on the top of the cupboard, and part of it underneath a lot of linen at the bottom of the drawer in my wardrobe. That would satisfy both of us.' "'Would it?' exclaimed Mr. Batchgrew, without any restraint upon his heavy rolling voice. "'Well, I must have picked up the serviette and ring with the banknotes, you see. I fear I'm absent-minded like that sometimes.' I know I went out of the sitting-room with both hands full. I know both hands were occupied, because I remember when I went into the back room I didn't turn the gas up, and I pushed a chair up to the cupboard with my knee for me to stand on. I'm certain I put some of the notes on the top of the cupboard. Then I came upstairs. 
The window on the landing was rattling, and I put the other part of the money on the chair while I tried to fasten the window. However, I couldn't fasten it, so I left it. And then I thought I picked up the money again off the chair, and came in here, and hid it at the bottom of the drawer, and locked the wardrobe. "'You thought,' said Thomas Batchgrew, gazing at the aged weakling as at an insane criminal, "'was this just after I left?' Mrs. Maldon nodded apologetically. "'When I woke up the first time in the night, it struck me like a flash. Had I taken the serviette and ring up with the notes? I am liable to do that sort of thing. I'm an old woman. It's no use denying it.' She looked plaintively at Rachel, and her voice trembled. I got up. I was bound to get up, and I turned the gas on, and there the serviette and ring were at the bottom of the drawer, but no money. I took everything out of the drawer, piece by piece, and put it back again. I simply cannot tell you how I felt. I went out to the landing with a match. There was no money there. And then I went downstairs in the dark. I never knew it to be so dark, in spite of the street lamp. I knocked against the clock. I nearly knocked it over. I managed to light the gas in the back room. I made sure that I must have left all the notes on the top of the cupboard instead of only part of them. But there was nothing there at all. Nothing. Then I looked all over the sitting-room floor with a candle. When I got upstairs again, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I was going to be ill, and I just managed to ring the bell for dear Rachel, and the next thing I remember was I was in bed here, and Rachel putting something hot to my feet, the dear child. Her eyes glistened with tears. And Rachel, too, as she pictured the enfeebled and despairing incarnation of dignity colliding with grandfather's clocks in the night, and climbing on chairs, and groping over carpets, had difficulty not to cry, and a lump rose in her throat. She was so moved by compassion that she did not at first feel the full shock of the awful disappearance of the money. Mr. Batchgrew, for the second time that morning, unequal to a situation, turned foolishly to the wardrobe, clearing his throat and snorting. "'It's on one of the sliding trays,' said Mrs. Molden. "'What's on one of the sliding trays?' the serviette rachel who was nearest opened the wardrobe and immediately discovered the missing serviette and ring which had the appearance of a direct dramatic proof of mrs maldon's story mr batchgrew exclaimed indignant i never heard such a rigmarole in all my born days and then angrily to rachel go down and look on the top of the cupboard thee rachel hesitated i'm quite resigned said mrs maldon placidly it's a punishment on me for hardening my heart to julian last night it's a punishment for my pride "'Now then!' Mr. Batchgrew glared bullyingly at Rachel, who vanished. In a few moments she returned. "'There's nothing at all on the top of the cupboard.' "'But the money must be somewhere,' said Mr. Batchgrew savagely. Nine hundred and sixty-five pun! And I've arranged to lend out that money again at once. What am I to say to the mortgager? Am I to tell him as I've lost it? No, I never!' Mrs. Maldon murmured. "'Nay, nay, it's no use looking at me. I thought I should never get over it in the night. But I'm quite resigned now.' Rachel, standing near the door, could observe both Mrs. Maldon and Thomas Batchgrew, and was regarded by neither of them, and while in the convulsive commotion of her feelings her sympathy for and admiration of Mrs. Maldon became poignant, she was thrilled by the most intense scorn and disgust for Thomas Batchgrew. The chief reason for her abhorrence was the old man's insensibility to the angelic submission, the touching fragility, the heavenly meekness and tranquillity of Mrs. Maldon, as she lay there helpless, victimised by a paralytic affliction. Rachel wanted to forget utterly the souvenir of Mrs. Maldon's paroxysm in the night, because it slurred the unmatched dignity of the aged creature. Another reason was the mere fact that Mr. Batchgrew had insisted on leaving the money in the house. Who but Mr. Batchgrew would have had the notion of saddling poor old Mrs. Maldon with the custody of a vast sum of money? It was a shame, it was positively cruel. Rachel was indignantly convinced that he alone ought to be made responsible for the money— and lastly she loathed and condemned him for the reason that he was so obviously unequal to the situation he could not handle it he was found out he was disproved he did not know what to do he could only mouth strut bully and make rude noises he could not even keep decently around him the cloak of self-importance he stood revealed to mrs maldon and rachel as he had sometimes stood revealed to his dead wife and to his elder children and to some of his confidential faithful employees he was an offence in the delicacy of the bedroom if the rancour of rachel's judgment had been fierce enough enough to strike him to the floor, assuredly his years would not have saved him. And yet Mrs. Maldon gazed at him with submissive and apologetic gentleness. Foolish saint! Fancy her, thought Rachel, hardening her heart to Julian. Rachel longed to stiffen her with some backing of her own harsh common sense, and her affection for Mrs. Maldon grew passionate and half-maternal. Part 4. Thomas Batchgrew was saying, "'It beats me how anybody in their senses could pick up a serviette and put it way for a pile of banknotes,' he scowled. However, I'll go and see Snow. I'll see what Snow says. I'll get him to come up with one of his best men, Dixon, perhaps. 
"'Thomas Batchgrew!' cried Mrs. Maldon, with sudden disturbing, febrile excitement. "'You'll do no such thing. I'll have no police prying into this affair. If you do that, I shall just die right off.' And her manner grew so imperious that Mr. Batchgrew was intimidated. "'But, but, I'd sooner lose all the money,' said Mrs. Maldon, almost wildly. She blushed, and Rachel also felt herself to be blushing, and was not sure whether she knew why she was blushing. An atmosphere of constraint and shame seemed to permeate the room. Mr. Batchgrew growled, "'The money must be in the house. The truth is, Elizabeth, ye don't know no more than that bedpost where ye put it.' And Rachel agreed eagerly, "'Of course it must be in the house. I shall set to and turn everything out, everything.' "'Ye'd better,' said Thomas Batchgrew. "'That will be the best thing, dear, perhaps,' said Mrs. Maldon, indifferent and now plainly fatigued. Everyone seemed determined to be convinced that the money was in the house, and to employ this conviction as a defence against horrible dim suspicions that had inexplicably emerged from the corners of the room, and were creeping about like menaces. "'Where else should it be?' muttered Batchgrew, sarcastically, after a pause, as if to say, "'Anybody who fancies the money isn't in the house is an utter fool.' Mrs. Maldon had closed her eyes. There was a faint knock at the door. Rachel turned instinctively to prevent a possible intruder from entering and catching sight of those dim suspicions before they could be driven back into their dark corner. Then she remembered that she had asked Mrs. Tarns to bring up some revelenta arabica food for Mrs. Maldon as soon as it should be ready, and she sedately opened the door. Mrs. Tarns, with her usual surf-like diffidence, remained invisible except for the hand holding forth the cup, but her soft voice charged with sensational news was heard— "'Mrs. Grocott's boy next door but one has just been round to the back to tell me there was a burglary down the lane last night.' As Rachel carried the food across to the bed, she could not help saying, though with feigned deference, to Mr. Batchgrew, "'You told us last night that there wouldn't be any more burglaries, Mr. Batchgrew.' The burning tightness round the top of her head, due to fatigue and lack of sleep, seemed somehow to brace her audacity and to make her careless of consequences. The trustee and celebrity, though momentarily confounded, was recovering himself now. He determined to crush the pert creature whose glance had several times incommoded him. He said severely, "'What's a burglary down the lane got to do with us and this here money?' "'Us and the money,' Rachel repeated evenly. "'Nothing. Only when I came downstairs in the night the greenhouse door was open.' The scullery was still often called the greenhouse, and I'd locked it myself. A troubling silence followed, broken by Mr. Batchgrew's uneasy grunts as he turned away to the window, and by the clink of the spoon as Rachel helped Mrs. Maldon to take the food. At length Mr. Batchgrew asked, staring through the window, "'Did you notice the dust on top of that cupboard? Was it disturbed?' Hesitating an instant, Rachel answered firmly, without turning her head, "'I did. It was, of course.' Mrs. Maldon made no sign of interest." Mr. Batchgrew's boots creaked to and fro in the room. "'And what's Julian got to say for himself?' he asked, not addressing either woman in particular. "'Julian wasn't here. He didn't stay the night. Louis stayed instead,' answered Mrs. Maldon faintly, without opening her eyes. "'What? What? What's this?' "'Tell him, dear, how it was,' said Mrs. Maldon, still more faintly. Rachel obeyed in agitated, uneven tones. End of chapter 5「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Christine Blashford, www.wokeupthismorning.co.uk. The Price of Love by Arnold Bennett. Chapter 6. Theories of the Theft. Part 1. The inspiring and agreeable image of Rachel floated above vast contending forces of ideas in the mind of Louis Fores, as he bent over his petty cash-book amid the dust of the vile inner office at Horrocleves, and their altercation was sharpened by the fact that Louis had not had enough sleep. He had had a great deal more sleep than Rachel, but he had not had what he was in the habit of calling his whack of it. Although never in a hurry to go to bed, he appreciated as well as any doctor the importance of sleep in the economy of the human frame, and his weekly average of repose was high. He was an expert sleeper. He thirsted after righteousness, and the petty cash-book was permeated through and through with unrighteousness, and it was his handiwork. Of course, under the unconscious influence of Rachel, seen in her kitchen, and seen also in various other striking aspects during the exciting night, he might have bravely exposed the iniquity of the petty cash-book to Jim Horrocleave, and cleared his conscience, and then gone and confessed to Rachel, and thus prepared the way for the inner peace and a new life. He would have suffered, there was indeed a possibility of very severe suffering, but he would have been a free man, yes, free, even if in prison, and he would have followed the fine tradition of rectitude, exhorting the respect and admiration of all true souls, etc. He had read authentic records of similar deeds. 
What stopped him from carrying out the programme of honesty was his powerful, worldly common sense. Despite what he had read, and despite the inspiring image of Rachel, his common sense soon convinced him that confession would be an error of judgment, and quite unremunerative for, at any rate, very many years. Hence he abandoned regretfully the notion of confession, as a beautifully impossible dream. But righteousness was not thereby entirely denied to him. His thirst for it could still be assuaged by the device of an oath to repay secretly to Horacleave every penny that he had stolen from Horacleave, which oath he took, and felt better and worthier of Rachel. He might, perhaps, have inclined more effectually towards confession had not the petty cash-book appeared to him in the morning light as an admirably convincing piece of work. It had the most innocent air, and was markedly superior to his recollection of it. On many pages he himself could scarcely detect his own traces. He began to feel that he could rely pretty strongly on the cleverness of the petty cash-book. Only four blank pages remained in it. A few days more and it would be filled up, finished, labelled with a gummed white label showing its number and the dates of its first and last entries, shelved and forgotten. A pity that Horacleave's suspicions had not been delayed for another month or so, for then the book might have been mislaid, lost, or even consumed in a conflagration. But never mind. A certain amount of ill-luck fell to every man, and he would trust his excellent handicraft in the petty cash-book. It was his only hope in the world now that the mysterious and heavenly banknotes were gone. His attitude towards the banknotes was, quite naturally, illogical and self-contradictory. While the banknotes were in his pocket, he had in the end seen three things with clearness. First, the wickedness of appropriating them. Second, the danger of appropriating them, having regard to the prevalent habit of keeping the numbers of banknotes. Third, the wild madness of attempting to utilise them in order to replace the stolen petty cash, for by no ingenuity could the presence of a hoard of over seventy pounds in the petty cash-box been explained. He had perfectly grasped all that, and yet, the notes having vanished, he felt forlorn, alone, as one who has lost his best friend, a prop and firm succour in a universe of quicksands. In the matter of the burning of the notes, his conscience did not accuse him. On the contrary, he emerged blameless from the episode. It was not he who first had so carelessly left the notes lying about. He had not searched them, he had not purloined them. They had been positively thrust upon him. His intention in assuming charge of them for a brief space was to teach some negligent person a lesson. During the evening, fate had given him no opportunity to produce them, and when in the night, with honesty unimpeachable, he had decided to restore them to the landing, fate had intervened once more. At each step of the affair he had acted for the best in difficult circumstances. Persons so ill-advised as to drop banknotes under chairs must accept all the consequences of their act. Who could have foreseen that while he was engaged on the philanthropic errand of fetching a doctor for an aged lady, Rachel would light a fire under the notes? No, not merely was he without sin in the matter of the banknotes, he was rather an ill-used person, a martyr deserving of sympathy. And further, he did not regret the notes, he was glad they were gone. They could no longer tempt him now, and their disappearance would remain a mystery for ever. So far as they were concerned, he could look his aunt or anybody else in the face without a tremor. The mere destruction of the immense undetermined sum of money did not seriously ruffle him. As an ex-bank clerk he was aware that, though an individual would lose, the state, through the Bank of England, would correspondingly gain, and thus for the nonce he had the large sensation of a patriot. Part two. Axon, the factotum of the counting-house, came in from the outer office, with a mien composed of mirth and apprehension in about equal parts. If Axon happened to be a subject of a conversation, and there was any uncertainty as to which Axon out of a thousand Axons he might be, the introducer of the subject would always say, "'You know, sandy-haired fellow.' This described him, hair, beard, moustache. Sandy-haired men have no age until they are fifty-five, and Axon was not fifty-five. He was a pigeon-flyer by choice, and a clerk in order that he might be a pigeon-flyer. His fault was that, with no moral right whatever to do so, he would treat Louis Forez as a business equal in the office, and as a social equal in the street. He sprang upon Louis now as one grinning valet might spring upon another, enormous with news, and whispered, "'I say, Governor's put his foot through them steps from painting-shop and sprained his ankle. Look out for ructions, eh? Thank the Lord it's a half-day!' and then whip back to his own room." On any ordinary Saturday morning, Louis, by a fine frigidity, would have tried to show to the obtuse Axon that he resented such demeanour towards himself on the part of an Axon, assuming as it did that the art director of the works was one of the servile crew that scuttled about in terror if the ferocious Horacleave happened to sneeze. But to-day the mere sudden information that Horacleave was on the works gave him an unpleasant start and seriously impaired his presence of mind. He had not been aware of Horacleave's arrival. He had been expecting to hear Horacleave's step and voice, and the rustle of him hanging up his mackintosh outside. Horacleave always wore a mackintosh instead of an overcoat. And all the general introductory sounds of his advent, before he finally came into the inner room. 
But now, for old Louis knew, Horrocleave might already have been in the inner room, before Louis. He was upset. The enemy was not attacking him in the proper and usual way. And the next instant, ere he could collect and reorganise his forces, he was paralysed by the footfall of Horrocleave, limping, and the bang of a door, and Louis thought, "'He's in the outer office. He's only got to take his Macintosh off, and then I shall see his head coming through this door, and perhaps he'll ask me for the petty cash-book right off.' But Horrocleave did not even pause to remove his Macintosh. In defiance of immemorial habit, being himself considerably excited and confused, he stalked straight in, half-hopping, and sat down in his frowsy chair at his frowsy desk with his cap at the back of his head. He was a spare man, of medium height, with a thin, shrewd face, and a constant look of hard, fierce determination. And there was Louis staring like a fool at the open page of the petty cash-book, incriminating himself every instant. "Hello," said Louis, without looking round. "'What's up?' "'What's up?' Horrocleave scowled. "'What do you mean?' "'I thought you were limping just the least bit in the world,' said Louis, whose tact was instinctive and indestructible. "'Oh, that!' said Horrocleave, as though nothing was further from his mind than the peculiarity of his gait that morning. He bit his lip. "'Slipped over something?' Louis suggested. "'Aye,' said Horrocleave, somewhat less ominously, and began to open his letters. Louis saw that he had done well to feign ignorance of the sprain, and to assume that Horrocleave had slipped, whereas in fact Horrocleave had put his foot through a piece of rotten wood. Everybody in the works, upon pain of death, would have to pretend that the employer had merely slipped, and that the consequences were negligible. Horrocleave had already nearly eaten an old man alive for the sin of asking whether he had hurt himself. And he had not hurt himself, because two days previously he had ferociously stopped the odd man of the works from wasting his time in mending just that identical stair, and had asserted that the stair was in excellent condition. Horrocleave, though Napoleonic by disposition, had a provincial mind, even a five-towns mind. He regarded as sheer loss any expenditure on repairs or renewals, or the process of cleansing. His theory was that everything would do indefinitely. He passed much of his time in making things do. His confidence in the theory that things could indeed be made to do was usually justified, but the steps from the painting-shop, a gimcrack ladder with handrail attached somehow externally to a wall, had at length betrayed it. That the accident had happened to himself, and not to a lad balancing a plank full of art lustre ware on one shoulder, was sheer luck, and now the odd man, with the surreptitious air of one engaged in a nefarious act, was putting a new tread on the stairs. Thus devoutly are the Napoleonic served. Horrocleave seemed to weary of his correspondence. "'By the by,' he said in a strange tone, "'let's have a look at that petty cash-book.' Louis rose, and with all his charm, with all the elegance of a man intended by nature for wealth and fashion instead of a slave on a foul pot-bank, gave up the book. It was like giving up hope to the last vestige, like giving up the ghost. He saw with horrible clearness that he had been deceiving himself, that Horrocleave's ruthless eye could not fail to discern at the first glance all his neat dodges, such as additions of ten to the shillings, and even to the pounds here and there, and ingenious errors in carrying forward totals from the bottom of one page to the top of the next. He began to speculate whether Horrocleave would be content merely to fling him out of the office, or whether he would prosecute. Prosecution seemed much more in accordance with the Napoleonic temperament, and yet Louis could not then conceive himself the victim of a prosecution. Anybody else, but not Louis Fores. Horrocleave, his elbow on the table, leaned his head on his hand and began to examine the book. Suddenly he looked up at Louis, who could not move, and could not cease from agreeably smiling. Said Horrocleave in a still more peculiar tone, "'Just ask Axon whether he means to go fetch wages to-day or to-morrow. Has he forgotten it Saturday?' Louis shot away into the outer office, where Axon was just putting on his hat to go to the bank. Alone in the outer office Louis wandered. The whole of his vitality was absorbed in the single function of wandering. Then, through the thin slit of the half-open door, between the top and the middle hinges, he beheld Horrocleave bending in judgment over the book, and he gazed at the vision in the fascination of horror. In a few moments Horrocleave leaned back, and Louis saw that his face had turned paler. It went almost white. Horrocleave was breathing strangely, his arms dropped downward, his body slipped to one side, his cap fell off, his eyes shut, his mouth opened, his head sank loosely over the back of the chair like the head of a corpse. He had fainted. The thought passed through Louis's mind that stupefaction at the complex unrighteousness of the petty cash records had caused Horrocleave to lose consciousness. Then the true explanation occurred to him. It was the pain in his ankle that had overcome the heroic sufferer. Louis had desired to go to his aid, but he could not budge from his post. Presently the colour began slowly to return to Horrocleave's cheek. His eyes opened. He looked round sleepily and then wildly, and then he rubbed his eyes and yawned. He remained cuisant for several minutes, while a railway lorry thundered through the archway, and the hooves of the great horse crunched on shores in the yard. Then he called in a subdued voice, "'Louis, where the devil are ye?' Louis re-entered the room, and as he did so, Horrocleave shut the petty cash-book with an abrupt gesture. 
"'Here, take it,' said he, pushing the book away. "'Is it all right?' Louis asked. Horrocleave nodded. "'Well, I've checked about forty editions,' and he smiled sardonically. "'I think you might do it a bit oftener,' said Louis, and then went on. "'I say, don't you think it might be a good thing if you took your boot off? You never know when you've slipped whether it won't swell. I mean the ankle.' "'Bosh!' exclaimed Horrocleave, with precipitation, but after an instant added thoughtfully, "'Well, I dunno. Wouldn't do any harm, would it? I say, get me some water, will you? I don't know how it is, but I'm as thirsty as a dog.' The heroic martyr, to the affirmation that he had not hurt himself, had handsomely saved his honour. He could afford to relax a little now the rigour of consistency in conduct. With twinges and yawns he permitted Louis to help him with the boot and to put an art lustre cup to his lips. Louis was in the highest spirits. He had seen the gates of the inferno and was now snatched up to paradise. He knew that Horrocleave had never more than half suspected him, and that the terrible Horrocleave pride would prevent Horrocleave from asking for the book again. Henceforth, saved by a miracle, he could live in utter rectitude, he could respond freely to the inspiring influence of Rachel, and he would do so. He smiled at his previous fears, and was convinced, by no means for the first time, that a providence watched over him because of his good intentions and his nice disposition, that nothing really serious could ever occur occur to Louis Fores. He reflected happily that in a few days he would begin a new petty cash-book, and he envisaged it as a symbol of his new life. The future smiled. He made sure that his Aunt Maldon was dying, and though he liked her very much and would regret her demise, he could not be expected to be blind to the fact that a proportion of her riches would devolve on himself. Indeed, in unluckily causing a loss of money to his Aunt Maldon, he had in reality only been robbing himself, so that there was no need for any kind of remorse. When the works closed for the weekend, he walked almost serenely up to Bikers for news, news less of his aunt's condition than of the discovery that a certain roll of banknotes had been mislaid. Part 3 The front door was open when Louis arrived at Mrs. Maldon's house, and he walked in. Anybody might have walked in. There was nothing unusual in this. It was not a sign that the mistress of the house was ill in bed, and its guardianship therefore disorganised. The front doors of Bursley, even the most select, were constantly ajar, and the fresh wind from off the pot-bank was constantly blowing through those exposed halls and up those staircases. For the demon of public inquisitiveness is understood in the five towns to be a nocturnal demon. The fear of it begins only at dusk. A woman who in the evening protects her parlour like her honour will, while the sun is above the horizon, show the sacred secrets of the kitchen itself to any one who chooses to stand on the front step. Louis put his hat and stick on the oak chest, and with a careless elegant gesture brushed back his dark hair. The door of the parlour was slightly ajar. He pushed it gently open and peeped round it with a pleasant arch expression, on the chance of there being someone within. Rachel was lying on the Chesterfield. Her left cheek, resting on her left hand, was embedded in the large cushion. A large coil of her tawny hair, displaced, had spread loosely over the dark green of the sofa. The left foot hung limp over the edge of the sofa, the jutting angle of the right knee divided sharply the drapery of her petticoat into two systems, and her right shoe, with its steel buckle, pressed against the yielding back of the Chesterfield. The right arm lay lissom like a snake across her breast. All her muscles were lax, and every full curve of her body tended downward in response to the negligent pose. Her eyes were shut, her face flushed, and her chest heaved with the slow regularity of her deep unconscious breathing. Louis, as he gazed, was enchanted. This was not Miss Fleckering, the companion and household help of Mrs. Maldon, but a nymph, a fay, the universal symbol of his highest desire. He would have been happy to kiss the glinting steel buckle, so feminine, so provocative, so coy. The tight rounded line of the waist, every bend of the fingers, the fall of the eyelashes, all were exquisite and precious to him after the harsh, unsatisfying, desolating masculinity of Horrocleaves. This was the divine reward of Horrocleaves, the sole reason of Horrocleaves. Horrocleaves only existed in order that this might exist, and be maintained amid cushions and the softness of calm and sequestered interiors, waiting for ever in acquiescence for the arrival of manful doers from Horrocleaves. The magnificent pride of male youth animated Louis. He had not a care in the world. Even his long unpaid tailor's bill was magically abolished. He was an embodiment of exulting hope and fine aspirations. Rachel stirred, dimly aware of the invasion, and Louis, actuated by the most delicate regard for her sensitive modesty, vanished back for a moment into the hall, until she should have fitted herself for his beholding. Mrs. Tams had come from somewhere into the hall. She was munching a square of bread and cold bacon, and she curtsied, exclaiming, "'It's never Mester Forrest. That's twice has been woke up this day.' "'Who's there?' Rachel called out, and her voice had the breaking, bewildered softness of a woman's in the dark, emerging from a dream. "'Sorry, sorry,' said Louis, behind the door." "'It's all right,' she reassured him. He returned to the room. She was sitting upright on the sofa, her arms a little extended, and the tips of her fingers touching the sofa. The coil of her hair had been arranged. 
The romance of the exciting night still clung to her for Louis, but what chiefly seduced him was the mingling in her mien of soft confusion and candid sturdy honesty and dependableness. He felt that here was not only a ravishing charm, but a source of moral strength from which he could draw inexhaustibly that which he had had a slight suspicion he lacked. He felt that here was joy and salvation united, and it seemed too good to be true. Strange that when she greeted him at the doorstep on the previous evening he had imagined that she was revealing herself to him for the first time, and again later in the kitchen he had imagined that she was revealing herself to him for the first time, and again still later in the sudden crisis at his bedroom he had imagined that she was revealing herself to him for the first time, for now he perceived that he had never really seen her before, and he was astounded and awed. "'Aren't he still on the upgrade?' he inquired, using all his own charm. He guessed, of course, that Mrs. Molden must be still better, and he was very glad, although if she recovered it would be she and not himself that he had deprived of banknotes. "'Oh, yes, she's better,' said Rachel, not moving from the sofa. "'But have you heard what's happened?' In spite of himself he trembled, awaiting the disclosure. Now for the banknotes, he reflected, bracing his nerves, he shook his head. She told him what had happened, she told him at length, quickening her speech as she proceeded, and for a few moments it was as if he was being engulfed by an enormous wave and would drown. But the next instant he recollected that he was on dry land, safe, high beyond the reach of any catastrophe. His position was utterly secure. The past was past, the leaf was turned. He had but to forget, and he was confident of his ability to forget. The compartments of his mind were innumerable, and as separate as the dungeons of a medieval prison. "'Isn't it awful?' she murmured. "'Well, it is rather awful.' nine hundred and sixty-five pounds fancy it the wave approached him again as she named the sum nevertheless he never once outwardly blenched as he had definitely put away unrighteousness so his face showed no sign of guilt like many ingenious-minded persons he had in a high degree the faculty of appearing innocent except when he really was innocent if you ask me said rachel she never took any of the notes upstairs at all she left them all somewhere downstairs and only took the serviette upstairs yes he agreed thoughtfully wondering whether on the other hand mrs Molden had not taken all the notes upstairs and left none of them downstairs was it possible that in that small roll in that crushed ball that he had dropped into the grate there was nearly a thousand pounds the equivalent of an income of a pound a week for ever and ever never mind the instant so far as he was concerned was closed the dogma of his future life would be that the banknotes had never existed and i've looked everywhere rachel insisted with strong emphasis Louis remarked thoughtfully, as though a new aspect of the affair was presenting itself to him. "'It's really rather serious, you know.' "'I should just say it was as much money as that.' "'I mean,' said Louis, "'for everybody, that is to say Julian and me, we're involved.' "'How can you be involved? You didn't even know it was in the house.' "'No, but the old lady might have dropped it. I might have picked it up. Julian might have picked it up. Who's to prove?' She cut in coldly. "'Please don't talk like that.' He smiled with momentary constraint. He said to himself— it won't do to talk to this kind of girl like that she won't stand it why she wouldn't even dream of suspicion falling on herself wouldn't dream of it after a silence he began well and made a gesture to imply that the enigma baffled him i give it up breathed rachel intimately i fairly give it up and of course that was the cause of her attack he said suddenly as if the idea had just occurred to him rachel nodded evidently well said he i'll look in again during the afternoon i must be getting along for my grub he was hoping that he had not unintentionally brought about his aunt's death. "'Not had your dinner?' she cried. "'Why, it's after half-past two. "'Oh, well, you know, Saturday. "'I shall get you a bit of dinner here,' she said, "'and then perhaps Mrs. Molden will be waking up. "'Yes,' she repeated positively, "'I shall get you a bit of dinner here myself. "'Mrs. Molden would not be at all pleased if I didn't. "'I'm frightfully hungry,' he admitted, and he was. "'When she had left the parlour, "'he perceived evidences here and there "'that she had been hunting up hill and down dale for the notes, "'and he went into the back room with an earnest examining air, "'as though he might find part of the missing hoard, after all, "'in some niche overlooked by Rachel. "'He would have preferred to think that Mrs. Molden "'had not taken the whole of the money upstairs, "'but reflection did much to convince him that she had. "'It was infinitely regrettable that he had not counted his treasure trove under the chair. "'Part Four the service of his meal which had the charm of a picnic was interrupted by the arrival of the doctor whose report on the invalid however was so favourable that louis could quite dismiss the possibly homicidal aspect of his dealings with the banknotes the shock of the complete disappearance of the vast sum had perhaps brought mrs molden to the brink of death but she had edged safely away again in accordance with her own calm prophecy that very morning when the doctor had gone, and the patient was indulged in her desire to be left alone for sleep, Louis very slowly and luxuriously finished his repast, with Rachel sitting opposite to him, in Mrs. Molden's place at the dining-table. He lit a cigarette, and gracefully leaning his elbows on the table, gazed at her through the beautiful grey smoke-veil, which was like the clouds of paradise. 
What thrilled Louis was the obvious fact that he fascinated her. She was transformed under his glance. How her eyes shone! How her cheek flushed and paled! What passionate vitality found vent in her little gestures! But in the midst of this transformation her honesty, her loyalty, her exquisite ingenuousness, her superb dependability remained. She was no light creature, no flirt nor seeker after dubious sensations. He felt that at last he was appreciated by one whose appreciation was tremendously worth having. He was confirmed in that private opinion of himself that no mistakes hitherto made in his career had been able to destroy. He felt happy and confident as never before. Luck, of course, but luck deserved. He could marry this unique creature and be idolised and cherished for the rest of his life. In an instant, from being a scorner of conjugal domesticity, he became a scorner of the bachelor's existence, with its immeasurable secret ennui hidden beneath the jaunty cloak of a specious freedom. Freedom to be bored, freedom to fret and long and envy, freedom to eat ashes and masticate dust. He would marry her. Yes, he was saved, because he was loved, and he meant to be worthy of his regenerate destiny. All the best part of his character came to the surface and showed in his face. But he did not ask his heart whether he was or was not in love with Rachel. The point did not present itself. He certainly never doubted that he was seeing her with a quite normal vision. Their talk went through and through the enormous topic of the night and day, arriving at no conclusion whatever, except that there was no conclusion, not even a theory of a conclusion. And the Louis who now discussed the case was an innocent, reborn Louis, quite unconnected with the Louis of the previous evening. He knew no more of the inwardness of the affair than Rachel did. Of such singular feats of doubling the personality is the self-deceiving mind capable. After a time it became implicit in the tone of their conversation that the mysterious disappearance in a small, ordinary house of even so colossal a sum as nine hundred and sixty-five pounds did not mean the end of the world. That is to say, they grew accustomed to the situation. Louis, indeed, permitted himself to suggest, as a man of the large, still-existing world, that Rachel should guard against overestimating the importance of the sum. True, as he had several times reflected, it did represent an income of about a pound a week, but after all what was a pound a week viewed in a proper perspective? Louis somehow glided from the enormous topic to the topic of the newest cinema. Rachel had never seen a cinema, except a very primitive one, years earlier, and old Batchgrew was mentioned, he being notoriously a cinema magnate. "'I cannot stand that man,' said Rachel, with a candour that showed to what intimacy their talk had developed. Louis was delighted by the explosion, and they both fell violently upon Thomas Batchgrew, and found intense pleasure in destroying him, and Louis was saying to himself enthusiastically, "'How well she understands human nature!' So that when old Batchgrew, without any warning or preliminary sound, stalked pompously into the room, their young confusion was excessive. They felt themselves suddenly in the presence of not merely a personal adversary, but of an enemy of youth and of love and of joy, of a being mysterious and malevolent who neither would nor could comprehend them, and they were at once resentful and intimidated. During the morning Councillor Batchgrew had provided himself, doubtless by purchase since he had not been home, with a dandiacal spotted white waistcoat in honour of the warm and sunny weather. This waistcoat, by its sprightly unsuitability to his aged uncouthness, somehow intensified the sinister quality of his appearance. "'Found it?' he demanded tersely. Rachel, strangely at a loss, hesitated and glanced at Louis as if for succour. "'No, I haven't, Mr. Batchgrew,' she said. "'I haven't, I'm sure. And I've turned over every possible thing, likely or unlikely.' Mr. Batchgrew growled. "'From the look of ye, I made sure that the money had turned up all right. Ye were that comfortable and cosy. Who'd guess there's nigh on a thousand pounds missing out of this house since last night?' The heavy voice rolled over them brutally. Louis attempted to withstand Mr. Batchgrew's glare, but failed. He was sure of the absolute impregnability of his own position, but the clear memory of at least one humiliating and disastrous interview with Thomas Batchgrew in the past robbed Louis's eye of its composure. The circumstances under which he had left the councillor's employ some years ago were historic and unforgettable. "'I came in back way instead of front way,' said Thomas Batchgrew, "'because I thought I'd have a look at that scullery door. Kitchen's empty.' "'What about the scullery door?' Louis lightly demanded. Rachel murmured. "'I forgot to tell you it was open when I came down in the middle of the night,' and then she added, "'Wide open.' "'Upon my soul,' said Louis slowly, with marked constraint, "'I really forgot whether I looked at that door before I went to bed. I know I looked at all the others.' "'I'd looked at it anyway,' said Rachel defiantly, gazing at the table. "'And when you found it open, miss,' pursued Thomas Batgrew, "'what did you do?' "'I shut it and locked it.' "'Where was the key?' "'In the door.' "'Lock in order?' yes well then how could it have been opened from the outside there isn't a mark on the door outside or in as far as that goes mr batchgrew said rachel 
Only last week the key fell out of the lock on the inside and slid down the brick floor to the outside. You know there's a slope. And I had to go out at the house by the front, and the lamplighter climbed over the back gate for me and let me into the yard so that I could get the key again. That might have happened last night. Someone might have shaken the key out and pulled it under the door with a bit of wire or something. That won't do, Thomas Batchgrew stopped her. You said the key was in the door on the inside. Well, when they'd once opened the door from the outside, couldn't they have put the key on the inside again? They? Who? Burglars. Thomas Batchgrew repeated sarcastically, "'Burglars! Burglars!' and snorted. "'Well, Mr. Batchgrew, either burglars must have been at work,' said Louis, who was fascinated by Rachel's surprising news and equally surprising theory. "'Either burglars must have been at work,' he repeated impressively, "'or the money is still in the house. That's evident.' "'Is it?' snarled Batchgrew. "'Look here, miss, and you, young Forrest, I didn't make much of this morning, because I thought the money had happened to be found. But seeing as it isn't, and as we're talking about it, what time was the rumpus last night?' "'What time?' Rachel muttered. "'What time was it, Mr. Forrest?' "'I don't know,' said Louis. "'Perhaps the doctor would know.' "'Oh,' said Rachel, "'Mrs. Tam said the hall-clock had stopped. That must have been when Mrs. Mulden knocked up against it.' She went to the parlour door and opened it, displaying the hall-clock, which showed twenty-five minutes past twelve. Louis had crept up behind Mr. Batchgrew, who, in his inapposite white waistcoat, stood between the two lovers, stertorious with vague anathema. "'So that was the time,' said he, "'and the burglars must have been and gone afore that. A likely thing, burglars coming at twelve o'clock at night, isn't it? And I'll tell ye something else. Them burglars was copped last night at night, but eleven o'clock, when the pub's closed, if ye want to know. The whole gang of three on em. "'Then what about that burglary last night down the lane?' Rachel asked sharply. "'Oh!' exclaimed Louis. "'Was there a burglary down the lane last night? I didn't know that.' "'No, there wasn't,' said Batchgrew ruthlessly. "'That burglary was a practical joke, and it's all over the town. Denry Makin had a hand in that affair, and by now I dare say he wishes he hadn't.' "'Still, Mr. Batchgrew,' Louis argued superiorly, with the philosophic impartiality of a man well accustomed to the calm unravelling of a crime, "'there may be other burglars in the land beside just those three. He would not willingly allow the theory of burglars to crumble. Its attractiveness increased every moment.' "'There may and there mayn't, young Forrest, said Thomas Batchgrew. "'Did you hear anything of him?' "'No, I didn't,' Louis replied restively. "'And yet you ought to have been listening out for him. "'Why ought I to have been listening out for them? "'Knowing there was all that money in the house.' "'Mr. Forrest didn't know,' said Rachel. "'Louis felt himself unjustly smirched. "'It's scarcely an hour ago,' said he, "'that I heard about this money for the first time.' "'And he felt as innocent and aggrieved as he looked. "'Mr. Batchgrew smacked his lips loudly. "'Then,' he announced, "'I'm going down to the police station to put it in Snow's hand.' Rachel straightened herself. But surely not without telling Mrs. Molden. Mr. Batchgrew fingered his immense whiskers. "'Is she better?' he inquired threateningly. This was his first sign of interest in Mrs. Molden's condition. "'Oh, yes, much. She's going on very well. The doctor's just been. Is she asleep?' "'She's resting. She may be asleep.' "'Did you tell her you hadn't found the money?' "'Yes.' "'What did she say?' "'She didn't say anything.' "'It might be municipal money, for all she seems to care,' remarked Thomas Batchgrew, with a short, bitter grin. "'Well, I'll be moving to the police station. I've never come across aught like this before, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it.' Rachel slipped out of the door into the hall. "'Please wait a moment, Mr. Batchgrew,' she whispered timidly. "'What for?' "'Till I've told Mrs. Molden. "'But if her's asleep. I must waken her. I couldn't think of letting you go to the police station without letting her know, after what she said this morning.' Rachel waited. Mr. Batchgrew glanced aside. "'Here, come here,' said Mr. Batchgrew in a different tone. The fact was that, put to the proof, he dared not, for all his autocratic habit, openly disobey the injunction of the benignant, indifferent, helpless Mrs. Molden. "'Come here,' he repeated coarsely. Rachel obeyed, shamefaced despite herself. Batchgrew shut the door. "'Now,' he said grimly, "'what's your secret? Out with it. I know you, and hers got a secret. What is it?' Rachel sat down on the sofa, hid her face in her hands, and startled both men by a sob. She wept with violence, and then through her tears and half looking up she cried out passionately, "'It's all your fault! Why did you leave the money in the house at all? You knew you'd no right to do it, Mr. Batchgrew!' The councillor was shaken out of his dignity by the incredible impudence of this indictment from a chit like Rachel. Similar experiences, however, had happened to him before, for, though as a rule people most curiously conspired with him to keep up the fiction that he was sacred, at rare intervals somebody's self-control would break down, and bitter, inconvenient home-truths would resound in the ear of Thomas Batchgrew. But he would recover himself in a few moments, and usually some diversion would occur to save him. He was nearly always lucky. A diversion occurred now, of the least expected kind. The cajoling tones of Mrs. Tams were heard on the staircase. "'Nay, ma'am, nay, ma'am, this'll never do. Must I go on my bended knees to ye?' And then the firm but soft voice of Mrs. Molden. "'I must speak to Mr. Batchgrew. I must have Mr. Batchgrew here at once. Didn't you hear me call and call to you?' 
"'That I didn't, ma'am. I was beating the feather bed in the back bedroom. "'Nay, not a step lower you go, ma'am, not if I lose me job for it.' Thomas Batchgrew and Louis were already out in the hall. Halfway down the stairs stood Mrs. Maldon, supporting herself by the banisters and being supported by Mrs. Tams. She was wearing her pink peignoir with white frills at the neck and wrists. Her black hair was loose on her shoulders like the hair of a young girl. Her pallid and heavily seamed features with the deep shining eyes trembled gently, as if in response to a distant vibration. She gazed upon the two silent men with an expression that united benignancy with profound inquietude and sadness. All her past life was in her face, inspiring it with strength and sorrow. "'Mr. Batchgrew,' she said, "'I've heard your voice for a long time. I want to speak to you.' And then she turned, yielded to the solicitous alarm of Mrs. Tams, climbed feebly up the stairs, and vanished round the corner at the top, and Mrs. Tams, putting her frowsy head for an instant over the handrail, stopped to adjure Mr. Batchgrew. "'Eh, mister, you'd better stop where you are a while.' From the parlour came the faint sobbing of Rachel. The two men had not a word to say. Mr. Batchgrew grunted, vacillating. It seemed as if the majestic apparition of Mrs. Maldon had rebuked everything that was derogatory and undignified in her trustee, and that both he and Louis were apologising to the empty hall for being common, base creatures. Each of them, and especially Louis, had the sense of being awakened to events of formidable grandeur whose imminence neither had suspected. Still assuring himself that his position was absolutely safe, Louis nevertheless was aware of a sinking in the stomach. He could rebut any accusation. And yet, murmured his craven conscience, what could be the enigma between Mrs. Maldon and Rachel? He was now trying to convince himself that Mrs. Maldon had in fact divided the money into two parts, of which he had handled only one, and that the impressive mystery had to do with the other part of the treasure, which he had neither seen nor touched. How then could he personally be threatened? And yet, said his conscience again, in about a minute Mrs. Tams reappeared at the head of the stairs. "'Her will have ye, master,' said she to the councillor. Thomas Batchgrew mounted after her. Louis made a noise with his tongue as if starting a horse, and returned to the parlour. Rachel, still on the sofa, showed her wet face. "'I've got no secret,' she said passionately, "'and I'm sure Mrs. Maldon hasn't. What's he driving at?' The natural freedom of her gestures and vehement accent was enchanting to Louis. She jumped from the Chesterfield and ran away upstairs flying. He followed to the lobby and saw her dash into her own room and feverishly shut the door, which was in full view at the top of the stairs, and Louis thought he had never lived in any moment so exquisite and so alarming as that moment. He was now alone on the ground floor. He caught no sound from above. "'Well, I'd better get out of this,' he said to himself. "'Anyhow, I'm all right. What a girl! Terrific!' And lighting a fresh cigarette, he left the house. Part 5 "'And now what's amiss?' Thomas Batchgrew demanded, alone with Mrs. Maldon in the tranquillity of the bedroom. Mrs. Maldon lay once more in bed, the bedclothes covered her without a crease, and from the neat fold-back of the white sheet her wrinkled ivory face and curving black hair emerged so still and calm that her recent flight to the stairs seemed unreal, impossible. The impression her mien gave was that she never had moved, and never would move, from the bed— Thomas Batchgrew's blusterous voice frankly showed acute irritation. He was angry because nine hundred and sixty-five pounds had monstrously vanished, because the chance of a good investment was lost, because Mrs. Maldon's tied his hands, because Rachel had forgotten her respect and his dignity in addressing him, but more because he felt too old to impose himself by sheer rough-riding, individual force on the other actors in the drama, and still more because he and nobody else had left the nine hundred and sixty-five pounds in the house— what an orgy of denunciation he would have plunged into had some other person insisted on leaving the money in the house with a similar result. Mrs. Maldon looked up at him with a glance of compassion. She was filled with pity for him because he had arrived at old age without dignity and without any sense of what was fine in life. He was not even susceptible to the chastening influences of a sick room. She knew, indeed, that he hated and despised sickness in others, and that when ill himself he became a moaning mass of cowardice and vituperation and in her heart she invented the most wonderful excuses for him, and transformed him into a martyr of destiny who had suffered both through ancestry and through environment. Was it his fault that he was thus tragically defective, so that by the magic power of her benevolence he became dignified in spite of himself? She said, "'Mr. Batchgrew, I want you to oblige me by not discussing my affairs with any one but me.' At that moment the front door closed firmly below, and the bedroom vibrated. "'Is that Louis going?' she asked. Batchgrew went to the window and looked downward, lowering the pupils as far as possible so as to see the pavement. "'It's Louis going,' he replied. Mrs. Maldon sighed relief. Mr. Batchgrew said no more. "'What were you talking about downstairs to those two? Mrs. Maldon went on carefully. "'What do you suppose we were talking about?' retorted Batchgrew, still at the window. Then he turned towards her and proceeded in an outburst. "'If you want to know, Mrs., I was asking that young wench what the secret was between you and her.' "'The secret between Rachel and me?' 
"'Aye, ye both know what's happened to them notes, and ye've made it up between ye to say nowt.' Mrs. Maldon answered gravely. "'You are quite mistaken. I know nothing, and I'm sure Rachel doesn't. And we have made nothing up between us. How can you imagine such things?' "'Why don't you have the police told?' "'I cannot do with the police in my house.' Mr. Batchgrew approached the bed almost threateningly. "'I'll tell you why you won't have the police told, because you know Louis Forrest has taken your money. It's as plain as a pikestaff. You put it on the chair on the landing here, and you left it there, and he came along and pocketed it.' Mrs. Maldon essayed to protest, but he cut her short. "'Did he, or did he not come upstairs after you'd been upstairs yourself?' As Mrs. Maldon hesitated, Thomas Batchery began to feel younger and more impressive. "'Yes, he did,' said Mrs. Maldon at length. "'But only because I asked him to come up, to fasten the window.' "'What window?' "'The landing window.' Mr. Batchery, startled and delighted by this unexpected confirmation of his theory, exploded. "'Ha! And how soon was that after you'd been upstairs with the notes?' "'It was just afterwards.' "'Ha! I don't mind telling you I've been suspecting that young man ever since this morning. I only learnt just now as he was in the house all night. That made me think for a moment as he'd done it after he'd all gone to bed, and for aught I know he may have. But done it some time he has, and you know it as well as I do, Elizabeth.' Mrs. Maldon maintained her serenity. "'We may be unjust to him. I should never forgive myself if I was. He has a very good side to him, has Louis.' "'I've never seen it,' said Mr. Batchgrew, still growing in authority. "'He began as a thief, and he'll end as a thief, if it's no worse.' "'Began as a thief,' Mrs. Maldon protested. "'Well, what do you suppose he left the bank for?' "'I never knew quite why he left the bank. I always understood there was some unpleasantness.' "'If you didn't know, it was because you didn't want to know. You never do want to know these things. Unpleasantness? There's only one sort of unpleasantness with the clerks in a bank. I know, anyhow, because I took the trouble to find out for myself when I had that bother with him in my own office. And a nice affair that was, too. But you told me at the time that his books were all right with you, only you preferred not to keep him.' Mrs. Maldon's voice was now plaintive. Thomas Batchgrew came close to the bed and leaned on the foot of it. "'There's some things as you won't hear, Elizabeth. His books were all right, but he'd made em all right. I got hold of him afore he'd done more than he could undo, that's all. There's one trifle, as I might have told ye, if ye hadn't had such a way of shutting folks up sometimes, missus. I'll tell ye now. Louis Fores went down on his knees to me in my office, on his knees and all blubbing. What about that?' Mrs. Maldon replied, he must have been glad ever since that you did give the poor boy another chance. "'There's nothing I've regretted more,' said Thomas Batchgrew, with a grimness that became him. "'I heard last week he's keeping books and handling cash for Horrocleave nowadays. I know how that'll end. I'd warn Horrocleave, but it's no business of mine, especially as ye made me help ye to put him into Horrocleave's. There's half a dozen people in this town and in Hanbridge that can add up Louis Fores and have added him up. And now he's robbed ye in your own house. But it makes no matter. He's safe enough.' He sardonically snorted. He's safe enough. We cannot even stop the notes without telling the police, and you won't have the police told. Oh, no. He's managed to get on the right side of you. However, he'll only finish in one way, that chap will, whether you and me's here to see it or not. Mr. Batchgrew had grown really impressive, and he knew it. Don't let us be hard, pleaded Mrs. Maldon, and then in a firmer, prouder voice. There will be no scandal in my family, Mr. Batchgrew, as long as I live. Mr. Batchgrew's answer was superb in its unconscious ferocity. That depends how long ye live. His meaningless eyes rested on her with frosty impartiality as he reflected, "'I wonder how long she'll last.' He felt strong, he felt immortal, exactly like Mrs. Maldon, he was convinced that he was old only by the misleading arithmetic of years, that he was not really old, and that there was a subtle and vital difference between all other people of his age and himself. As for Mrs. Maldon, he regarded her as a mere poor relic of an organism. "'At our age,' Mrs. Maldon began, and paused as if collecting her thoughts, "'At our age! At our age!' he repeated, sharply deprecating the phrase. "'At our age,' said Mrs. Maldon, with slow insistence, "'we ought not to be hard on others. We ought to be thinking of our own sins.' But although Mrs. Maldon was perhaps the one person on earth whom he both respected and feared, Thomas Batchgrew listened to her injunction only with rough disdain. He was incapable of thinking of his own sins. While in health he was nearly as unaware of sin as an animal.' Nevertheless, he turned uneasily in the silence of the pale room, so full of the shy and prim refinement of Mrs. Maldon's individuality. He could talk morals to others in the grand manner, and with positive enjoyment, but to be sermonised himself secretly exasperated him, because it constrained him and made him self-conscious. Invariably, when thus attacked, he would execute a flank movement. He said bluntly, "'And I suppose you'll let him marry this Rachel girl if he's a mind to?' Slowly a deep flush covered Mrs. Maldon's face. "'What makes you say that?' she questioned, with rising agitation. "'I have but just seen them together.' Mrs. Maldon moved nervously in the bed. "'I should never forgive myself if I stood by and let Louis marry Rachel,' she said, and there was a sudden desperate urgency in her voice. "'Isn't she good enough for a nephew of yours?' 
"'She's good enough for any man,' said Mrs. Maldon quietly. "'Then it's him as isn't good enough, and yet if he's got such a good side to him as ye say,' Mr. Batchgrew snorted. "'He's not suited to her, not at all.' "'Now, Mrs.' said Mr. Batchgrew in triumph, "'at last we're getting down to your real opinion of young Forres.' "'I feel I'm responsible for Rachel, and what ought I to do about it?' "'Do? What can a body do when a respectable young woman with red hair takes a fancy to a youth? Now, Elizabeth, that young woman'll marry Louis Forres, and you can take it from me.' "'But why do you say a thing like that? I only began to notice anything myself last night.' "'She's lost her head over him, that's all. I caught him just now, as thick as thieves in your parlour. "'But I'm by no means sure that he's smitten with her. "'What does it matter whether he is or not? She's lost her head over him, and she'll have him. "'It doesn't want a telescope to see as far as that.' "'Well, then, I shall speak to her. I shall speak to her to-morrow morning, after she's had a good night's rest, when I feel stronger.' "'Aye, you may. And what shalt say?' "'I shall warn her. I think I shall know how to do it,' said Mrs. Maldon, with a certain air of confidence and her trouble. "'I wouldn't run the risk of a tragedy for worlds.' "'It's no risk of a tragedy, as you call it,' said Thomas Batchgrew, very pleased with his own situation in the argument. "'It's a certainty. She'll believe him afore she believes you, whatever ye say. You mark me. It's a certainty.' After elaborate preparations of his handkerchief, he blew his nose loudly, because blowing his nose loudly affected him in an agreeable manner. A few minutes later he left, saying the car would be waiting for him at the back of the town hall, and Mrs. Maldon lay alone until Mrs. Tams came in with a tray. "'And I hope that's enough company for one day,' said Mrs. Tams. "'Now sup it up, do.'" End of chapter 6